Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started now. Uh, I'm Connie Wolford. I'm the nurse practitioner with the Stanford Neuromuscular Program, and I'm joined today by Carly Siskind, who you might have met earlier today, our uh, genetic counselor with the Neuromuscular Program. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Over the last three days, we have heard from many experts providing care for individuals with SMA. Now we're gonna hear from the real experts, uh, those that are living with SMA and receiving this care. So a very big welcome and thank you to our panelists today. We have Morgan Duffy, Isaac Fiera and his parents, Eli Fiera and Tian Yi Zhang, David Criswell and his mom, Christy Holman. So thank you so much again for joining us folks um, and offering your perspectives on uh, living with SMA and the care that you've been provided over the years. Um, we are going to ask that each of you maybe give us a, a little uh, background on you, on yourselves, and then uh, we'll start by asking a few questions that we've come up with. If the audience has questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A section on Whova. And Carly's going to field those questions while I begin with some of the uh, questions we came up with. So um, let's first meet Morgan Duffy. Morgan, tell us about yourself. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I wish I could be in person with all of you. I'm Morgan. I'm uh, almost 30 and living with SMA. I live here in the Bay Area, but uh, grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I work for an alphabet company called Verily, uh, where I work on substance use disorder treatment technology. And uh, really excited to be here. I have a type three SMA and use a power wheelchair. Thank you, Morgan. Isaac, it's very nice to meet you. Hi. Um, this is Isaac right here, um, who is two years and nine months um, old right now. So Isaac has type one SMA. He was diagnosed when he was four months old um, by our pediatrician. And he has had um, all three <laughs> FDA approved uh, SMN1 targeting drugs. And um, he's starting to be a, a, a sitter a little bit and um, he's doing great. And this is um, his sister who is five years old, whom we have not done any testing on. So we have no idea whether she's a carrier affected at all. And we have not had any testing oh done either. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us guys. David and Christy, are you there? I, um, I'm David and I am 12 years old and I have SMA type three and was officially diagnosed a year ago since March of this year. I have been receiving Spinraza. Great, thank you, David. It's very nice to meet you. I appreciate you participating. Um, all right, I'm going to just go forward with a few of our uh, questions. I'll probably just um, ask these and pose it to each one of you. Um, number one, you've already answered some of these questions. Have you received any disease modifying treatments for your SMA? And then as a follow up to that, how has the new landscape of options influenced your treatment choices? Um, so let's start with Morgan, since we haven't heard about your treatment options yet or your, your treatment choice yet. Sure. Um, so I started receiving Spinraza about two years ago um, with Connie and the team at Stanford. I um, have a spinal fusion, so I received that um, with a guided CT. Um, makes for an interesting day, but I think we've really uh, worked with the radiology team at Stanford to, to figure that out. Um, we've talked a bit about me. Uh, I've considered other options. Um, but for now, I'm seeing some good benefits with Spinraza. Uh, before starting treatment, I was seeing a pretty significant decline since I was about 18. Um, it was steady. And since starting, I've seen some improvements, but uh, even more than that, just a, a nice steady pace of feeling healthy and getting a lot more energy. So for now, um, I'm sticking with Spinraza because of the 
the benefits that I'm seeing and some open questions um, that we have about dosing and, and how much I weigh and, and things like that for RISD and other options. But um, I'll continue to work with Connie and the team to figure out if I should switch, but for now, I'm sticking with the one, one choice. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, and Isaac, how about you? Or Isaac, parents rather. <laughs> So we, we, when we got diagnosed, we started on Spinraza um, and we saw great, great improvements. Um, There's a lot of, of fluctuations, um, especially with his swallowing and that, you know, every time, like before his dosing, he, he basically lose his swallow and then kind of regain it again. And like, that was, that was challenging. We did, I guess when we were diagnosed, we did see kind of coming down the pipeline all the different drugs and so i think we were able to kind of at least digest and kind of see a future path and what we what we thought we wanted we we were very fortunate and we are very fortunate that we were able to get all three and incident you know they coincided with the eap and and basically with zolgensma and with evrisd he got on the eap like a week before it was fda approved and so like um, it's been very um, interesting in that regard. Um, and the EAP is the expanded access program that allows people to get the treatment before it's FDA approved, just for the folks who may not know the acronym. Thank you. you. got Zogensma when last summer. And so you got Zogensma. You know, I, I was super interested in the gene therapy trial when he was diagnosed, but there were no more slots left on, on the trial. And so we were always looking for opportunities. And so when the, um, the expanded access program uh, became available, we we actually, through Dr. Day and the whole team's help, actually went to Ohio to get him Zogensma. Um, and he was treated at 18 months with Sojensma. And, um, you know, we were able to continue Spinraza um, about four months after he had received Sojensma just through the fact that, you know, um, my insurance allowed it to happen. Um, and then we continue to basically see gains. And now obviously it's impossible to tell um, which one is the most effective for him, I guess. Um, and I don't know if you talked about Rizoplan. Well, then we decided to switch to from Spinraza to Rizoplan and we started in early August. This year, um, so when and, he was two and a half, I, I guess, yeah. And, and I think that was primarily the, the swallow and the, the fluctuation and and also with the pandemic, the, the challenges of like going to the hospital and I think that kind of, push this over the edge to, to make that transition. Right. You guys certainly have a, a unique perspective that most people have not experienced having had all three um, FDA approved treatments now. So we're very fortunate. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, David and Christy, how about you guys? Um, David, uh, we weren't sure exactly uh, his diagnosis until a year ago. Um, and a year ago, he definitely started to progress um, where uh, it was affecting his mobility, um, just being a little 11 year old kid. And um, so a year ago he was diagnosed and then we quickly were, um, we were selected for the um, DEVOTE trial. And so he is receiving Spinraza and, and with Spinraza and the therapy treatment, um, it's, it's absolutely amazing um, the effect that it's had on his life. So he's able to play and run and do his scooter um, with his friends. And so um, we're very, very lucky um, for the, the treatment plan that he's been given, the opportunities. That's awesome, thank you. Uh, let me just go back to my slides here and, uh, sorry, go on to my next question. Uh, how does, uh, how do you see the role of therapy in uh, your management of SMA? Uh, let's see, Morgan, we'll go back to you. Sure. Um, so I think uh, sometimes uh, those of us who have had SMA uh, for a long time, we kind of, I mean, I guess I should just speak for myself. I wasn't really uh, managing my SMA for probably about 15 years. 
Um, after I was no longer in pediatric physical therapy, it was kind of a check in with my primary care provider uh, regularly, like somebody without SMA would, and just keep moving as much as I could. Um, so the introduction of Spinraza and the approval of Spinraza really made me think more about managing my SMA. I think beforehand it was honestly more of a coping mechanism, not to, to really think about it or focus on what was happening with the research because never thought that there would be Spinraza or Ristaplam or any of these other amazing drugs. Um, so it's definitely changed how much time I spend thinking about SMA, how I think about my, um, my diet, my exercise. I think I've become much healthier since starting Spinraza. And um, it's just made it more, uh, I guess, manageable for me to have a team uh, at Stanford that's, that's dedicated to kind of answering all of the questions that I had that previously um, teams in, in different parts of the country just weren't really sure how to answer it. So the increase of knowledge has made uh, me a lot healthier. And um, I'm excited to see how you know, these, origin these first three approvals really open up um, the space for more drugs and interventions for people with SMA and, and other neuromuscular diseases. Thank you, Morgan. And that's um, actually a very a common uh, thing that we find with adults with SMA that they have oftentimes lost, uh, been lost to, to medical management overall. And that's something we try to stress in our center that um, SMA management really should be about more than just pharmacology. It should be overall management. So. So we're very happy to have lots of adults coming back into the medical medical system here with us. Um, Isaac, how about you? Sorry, yeah. Just trying to unmute. Um, you know, I, I think I think Isaac, since he's a type one, I think that, you know the Spinraza and the Spinraza especially probably was essential in keeping him healthy and develop um, long enough and old enough to be able to receive the other uh, therapies for him to be able to make enough gains um, to the point where he is now. So I personally feel like the therapy is essential for him just to be alive at this point because he's over the age of two. But right now, um, it is it allows him the muscle and neuron development, um, but really has to be paired more and more so with all the therapies that are becoming more and more essential because um, you know the little ones develop so differently depending on when they receive treatment, what kind of treatments they've had. And so now that we're on an oral drug that doesn't require us to have procedures, especially in the midst of COVID, et cetera, I think we have more peace of mind that we can just dose them every day through the D-tube. And then it allows us to focus a lot more on PTOT and now I think mainly speech because um, you guys can tell he makes sounds, but he's not uh, that understandable yet. And so um, I see the therapy as the foundation upon which that, I mean the therapy by treatment. So I see the, the medical treatment as the foundation upon which that we build with the other therapies to try to allow him to develop and and gain strength and get stronger. Mm -hmm. So, can I just ask how many hours a week uh, of therapy does Isaac receive? So um, about five hours a week. Um, you know, pretty much something, almost something every other day or every day right. throughout the week. And that's less actually compared to before. The pandemic obviously we're not really getting swallow right now because that tends to be in person and we've dropped one pt that's private and so i would say maybe on average seven to eight hours before covid and now five so four or five yeah. yeah and and that's it uh people coming to your home or through zoom or zoom. home exercise programs yeah zoom zoom it's just zoom at this point yeah. 
Zoom. And I mean, that's just the, I guess, the organized um, sessions. Obviously, we do therapies with them all day long through various things at home. And so I think for that, I mean, we do standard. We, we actually were lucky enough to have a little hot tub. And so we try to, we're trying to get um, water therapy going for him more so. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Right. It does. Thank you so much. Uh, David, are you receiving any therapies right now? And how does that kind of play into your daily activities, your life? So um, we just were able to finally get CCS uh, Children's Services going. And so he does receive physical therapy every week. It's been really critical now that he's not at school trying to kind of move around the campus because that was contributing to his fatigue and us understanding how much he's able to be mobile. Um, and so now it's it's kind of that that time where he's able to focus on what he needs to focus on um, with his growth and his strength. Um, and so it, it's been really, really great to be in, um, in the hands of professionals who understand. That was the biggest thing when we got to our providers because when we go to Stanford, we have this team of amazing people who know what we're talking about, but we're also, we're from the Central Coast. So a lot of providers there aren't um, as knowledgeable about what we're talking about. Um, and so when he finally was able to connect with the providers that he has now, his occupation, occupational therapist and his physical therapist, um, they actually, I, I believe, attended this conference last year. And so as soon as we walked in the door, they said, we know Dr. Tessie Rocha, we know um, everything about the specific um, SMA that he has. And so it was just a relief to have providers who know exactly how to target him um, and help him continue to just build his strength and manage, uh, manage SMA. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we're able to, to reach uh, therapists across the community. Um, and, you know, therapists in many of the uh, larger centers are also oftentimes willing to reach out to uh, your local provider as well and provide some, um, some background and advice on what to, where to go. Sorry, I'm going to have to go back to my... Oh, we do have some questions from the audience. Maybe great, I'll let's take some questions. So we have a couple uh, person-specific questions and then we have a uh, general question. So we'll start with for Morgan. What factors led you to select Spinraza as your, as your choice of treatment? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I was following the trials uh, before Spinraza was approved. And at the time it was approved, it was the only option for adults with SMA. So. I started, I want to say maybe six months after FDA approval. I was definitely a part of the population of adults that wanted to see how adults were responding in the real world, given that uh, adults weren't included in many of the phase three trials. Um, so I waited a, a bit, um, but really it was my, my best option. And it was only maybe three or four months ago, Connie, I think we started talking about um, other options for me. So I think it really depends on like my month to month progress with Spinraza and how it's going. Um, and I've seen, you know, pretty steady um, minor improvements, but lack of progression. So for me that just like checking in with myself, um, keeping track of my home exercise progress and my stamina, um, and making sure that, that I'm feeling good every day is a huge factor in my decision. And um, I think over time, I would evaluate other options, uh, but I tend to like to see some real world evidence before making uh, transitions. And Morgan, I'm gonna keep stay with you for just a second because sure. um, one of the points that came up yesterday and, and that reminds me of something you just said, this idea of waiting to see how things happen within the adult community. And then one of the things that came up yesterday is that there are people who really had a difficulty of uh, combining their getting therapy with their uh, identity within the disability community. And is yeah. that something that you've had conflict with? Totally. Um, yeah. I think that it really resonates with me. I, I have a, I'm really fortunate to have a few friends that also have SMA and we 
grew up together. And I think for a lot of us born in the 90s, those um, communities uh, have been just so critical to our foundation and our friends. A lot of us went to the same colleges because once one person kind of paved the path of accessibility and independence, a lot of us tried to follow that. And um, I really see myself as benefiting from my disability more than it hindering me. I think it's opened a lot of opportunities for me. It's given me incredible academic opportunities. I've done, I, I went to Stanford undergrad and it, I think, I, I really don't think I would have gotten in if I didn't have the perspective that I did uh, growing up disabled in a, in a small city. So, you know, the idea of, I would say cures uh, was always really problematic to me because being disabled is, is so central to who I am. And I think, um, <laughs> I don't know, I think, um, I think just, when I- Just so that everybody knows, because no yeah. one else this Tian just <laughs> messaged Morgan and said, you would have gotten in anyways. <laughs> but um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I do think that um, as I was getting older and things like personal care were getting more complicated, I had more of a desire to live alone and not really have this like long-term reliance on my family and friends. And as I started thinking more about, you know, wanting to have a family of my own, the idea of these therapies giving me more of a chance at independence and just a better balance between, you know, my own health and my identity was something that I grappled with. But I think I found a good medium. I, I don't see myself as, uh, as taking Spinraza as anything that detracts from my disability because of all of the, the components of like what I've learned over my life and the communities I'm involved in. Uh, but it's, it's an ongoing choice and debate. And, um, you know, my partner and I are now debating what sort of genetic testing we want to do um, when we have children, um, because that's, you know, that's a, it's a big choice for me, um, how I want to raise kids if they were disabled as well. Well, loop me into that conversation. I'm happy to have that with you too. Uh, thanks, Morgan. Thanks. Uh, David, how hard is it for you for the to get the injections? And do you notice the changes that your mom mentioned? Um, getting the injection is not that hard, I would say. Um, and I do notice the changes. I've been getting a lot stronger when I started getting the injections and it's been a lot easier playing with my friends and stuff like that. Is there something in particular you've noticed really has gotten better? Um, I have a lot more energy. And so like, When I'm playing with my friends, I don't get tired really easily anymore. It takes longer for me to get tired and I can like catch up with them and stuff like that. That must feel really great too. <laughs> That's such a, a change. Has that been important for you with your relationships with your friends? Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, Let's see, I'm checking, there's so many questions. Uh, so there is a general question, I think for everybody, but is anybody taking any specific special nutrition? Is there any changes to nutrition? So maybe we can start with Isaac's family. Um, so we use um, complete so, pediatric. I, um, so no. Isaac is about I would say 90% YouTube dependent. So he follows solids a little bit. So we do introduce bits of whatever we're eating for him, but. But it's more like sport feeding and just to try to like <laughs> strengthen his, you know, swallow and his, his eating. But, uh, um, but the YouTube feeds are, we use a Nestle complete pediatric and he tolerates it well. And, you know, um, I imagine when he gets a little older, we'll probably try to like broaden his his diet. But for now, it's it's working well for him. 
Wait, we we haven't followed the I guess the the AA diet, and he's pretty much fifty percentile on his growth curve, so and no GI symptoms. So we figured that we would just go along with the two feet yeah. for now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Morgan, any special things in your diet? I take a daily vitamin D uh, and Connie is always reminding me that my vitamin D levels are low. Um, so I do that. And I recently introduced a, a fiber supplement as well um, to just help with my general nutrition. Um, those two are the, the most regular and I try to have a, a pretty like high protein diet. I think like a lot of adults, I get um, hungrier after my spin rasas and find that, that I need a bit more protein. So um, I've tried to have a, a high protein, high fiber diet as much as I can. David? He takes a, a regular diet. We've tried to manage headaches, you know, just as like a, a side thing. So um, magnesium, but other than that, his diet is regular. Great. Uh, so question for pretty much everybody here is, how do you tell your friends about your diagnosis? <laughs> oh, getting lots of smiles for that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, David, why don't you start? What do you tell your friends? <laughs> this is a constant conversation that we have in our home. Um, he's learning how to have that conversation. Um, it's been a challenge his whole life to try. Well, we didn't know. Um, it was obvious that it, he was different. Um, he was falling constantly, couldn't keep up. They'd play tag and they'd pick him last and they'd all run away and he couldn't play soccer. You know, we had to explain why you can't keep joining soccer teams. And so it was hiking with our friends. So like progressively, um, we knew that there was something going on with him. Um, but it, it was really, I think, big for him to have words. As soon as we finally got a diagnosis last year, he had words. Um, and so how do you, what are some of the ways that you communicate to your friends? Um, we're working on this. This is a conversation that we're constantly trying to, to navigate because obviously I say it differently than he does. I tell them like that like I can't keep up like like I don't like say it like I I, I just say like I don't know I this might be something that uh, Morgan can can share oh, with you yeah He's absolutely experience before so Morgan what would you tell what would you say to David yeah I I have to think back a bit. Um, I've always le like leaned on humor um, when it came to introducing uh, my disability to others. I think um, with my peers growing up, I started using a power wheelchair when I was 11. So uh, that kind of did a lot of the explanation for me, um, which I actually, was probably helpful instead of having to talk too much about it. Um, so that was, I think that that was how I did it. And as I got older, I would just always be really open to people asking questions. Um, if people asked uh, even some questions that might be perceived as kind of like rude, like what happened to you or what's going on or why are you different? Um, I, my family just taught me to, to kind of laugh and then get really specific and tell people I have SMA and it's a neuromuscular degenerative disorder. And then you just kind of let them sit there with that. And often they won't ask any other questions. Um, but it became important to me at a young age to say, I use a wheelchair, but I do everything that I want to do. Um, or I use a wheelchair, but so I could kind of counteract those really negative reactions that a lot of the general public has. Um, and now in my workplace, you know, I work with scientists and doctors um, and engineers every day. Um, so I've, I am pretty open um, that I have SMA in my workplace. I still kind of default to humor sometimes. Um, 
on Zoom, I'll like hover away, so, like out of the background, you know, because my chair drives in a certain way and people will chuckle and will like use that as a, a way for me to tell new people that haven't met me in person that I use a wheelchair. So I guess, yeah, lean with humor um, and be really specific and um, be open to, to answering even strangers questions. Yeah, Tian and Eli, have you guys had to tell friends or? We, I mean, I think Isaac obviously can't speak for himself. Um, we, we probably, I mean, we did friends and family, but I think that was a pretty heavy conversation because he was so young. So I get Terry just still talking about it, but um, I, I think it's actually more helpful to hear um, Morgan and I'm sorry, I forgot. I see Christy's name, but I forgot. David. David, I'm sorry. I, I I was listening intently because I hope to learn from, you know, grownups or or patients, I guess, with SMA who can speak for themselves. And we're getting into books written by um, patients, and we're definitely getting the two books that was recommended. I think I, either the day before or yesterday and trying to learn because as he becomes more aware, we're gonna have have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. I think the conversations we probably have had are surrounding Addie, our five-year-olds, to explain to her that, I mean, right now we're just saying he's different because she doesn't know what SMA is, right? And so we're not being so specific because I think when it comes to a two and a half year old, overwhelmingly the response from other people is sort of sad. And we don't want that because I identify with the humor bit. Um, that's how I really deal with any difficulty in life. And there's nothing really funny about that yet. Um, but I think as he's getting stronger mm -hmm. and that's how we are. So we hope that our kids carry on that trait and using humor to um, explain to other people that why he's different. And so Addie, our five-year-old basically just, she's, she's a great big sister. She just is, she just knows Isaac as different and she helps take care of him. And she just tells her friends that Isaac is weaker than normal and he needs more help. I, so I think that's as far as we've gotten in having those conversations so far. It's a hard conversation to have, I mean, for everybody. And yeah. I, I think part of that too is like, one of the cool things I think from this conversation is Morgan talking about her and her partner and to, having this discussion about having a family. And when you have a two-year-old, it's hard to think about that future and the having a family piece of it. So Morgan, you wanna talk, can I put you on the spot and talk more about that side of things? Yeah, absolutely. I. Um... No, it, it's it's good for me to hear the, the parent side of things too. Um, I, I just want to say there there's a few of us, a, a few of my friends who have SMA and, and other patients at Stanford too, um, that are always really happy to to talk to parents of kids that are just kind of getting used to this and the language and you know the the empowerment side of it too. So happy to always be a resource there. Um, yeah, my, my partner and I, we were supposed to get married this summer, but because of COVID, uh, delayed everything. Um, but we, we both want to have a family and, you know, he is an incredibly supportive partner, especially in 2020 has taken on so much of my personal care so that we don't have to have, um, folks coming into our home to help me. Um, and I think that it, it's really Kind of shown a light on like what it's going to take for us to add more people uh, to our home and um, how we want to kind of balance that um, responsibility uh, is a big conversation that we have. Um, and I, I do think that um, if our child was to have SMA, it would kind of even further outweigh that balance of just like all of the things that we need to think about and manage on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we think about genetic testing and, and things like that and the potential of him being a carrier, um, we don't think he is because he's British and it's, it's a bit more rare um, for British folks to be carriers. Um, but just in case, uh, it's, it's definitely a part of, of the balance, but 
we try to be really practical um, in our equations. And, you know, I've kind of made a, a pact with him that once we do expand our family, whether it's through me at having kids or through surrogacy or even adoption, um, that I would take on more of, of my own personal care needs, whether that's through other people, um, like hiring other people, we're kind of like saving for that so that we can do that. Um, and then he can focus a bit on, on our kids and keeping them safe and healthy too. That's really nice. Um, and we are at the point where we are supposed to end, but I don't, I don't know. Connie, do you want to? <laughs> Well, um, let's see, how about just one last question, if that's okay. Um, this is something we asked last year, and I think it's good for all the providers that are listening in our audience to hear, is there anything about your uh, SMA care and disease management that you wish your providers understood better or you know, could do differently? How can we, how can we learn from you? Morgan? Yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm talking don't feel, a lot. Don't feel embarrassed because I am one of your providers. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're an, a, a, to speak. <laughs> trust me, um, I, I'm happy to. I think it's less reflective of the care that I get at Stanford. And, and I was actually um, working with the OSU, Ohio State team for a few months while I lived in Columbus for work. Um, and I think uh, the best part about how care is being delivered now versus when I was a kid is I'm not being reward for progress that's like outside of my control. I think it really is, a, I think it's a negative way to approach treating people with SMA to like really praise us for getting stronger or becoming more typical or normal because that like language just it doesn't do me personally any service and I don't think it does any of my friends service so I think it's about having a conversation with us in the beginning of, of working with us about what is important and what would be seen as a victory for us personally and make it more about that and less about how any person would come with like their preconceived biases of like what is progress because I, I think it's going to be really different for everybody and for the years that I, I wasn't involved in the medical system with it because of my SMA it was because doctors said really icky things to me and I didn't appreciate it and um, I, I think now it's it's really changed um, in just 20 years but uh, I think there's even more improvements that could be made. Um, so I would recommend, you know, books like No Pity and movies like Crip Camp on Netflix um, and others to just understand the culture behind disability too. Thank you. That's great. Christy, I, this is kind of new for you guys, but have you perceived any, any changes or things that you wish your providers understood a little better. It's so neat to have you, Morgan, because you like you've been through this whole thing as everybody's learned, right? Um, so it's so neat to hear your perspective. Um, we we like I said, I think just um, like our pediatrician, just the education around it, because um, that's the hard part is we don't feel like he really like even um, in the school systems, our district nurse um, doesn't really know anything about it. So she can't help us develop a plan that's really um, fits him well. Um, so I think there's just more education um, so that people, we don't have to keep saying the same, you know, we try to tell, and we're not, we're not that great at it yet either. We're still learning and we're doing our best to advocate um, for himself and for, you know, for me to advocate for him. But I think just more education. And I just really appreciate when people are educated about it. Um, like the OT and the PT that I spoke about before, it just really, I can trust them because they understand it and they can provide care. Um, I think that, that he can benefit from so, and I really appreciate your perspective, Morgan. Deanne, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to follow up to Christy's comment and just thinking Morgan's comments because I feel like I see 
a bright and happy future for Isaac and hopefully he's like that one day um, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to talk without crying because I was not I'm totally fine I was <laughs> not expecting to get so emotional I, I think our message really today is we just are overwhelmingly thankful to be honest yeah everyone's been so great and the, the care has been wonderful and especially like during the pandemic and every all the caregivers that are go an extra mile to continue the, the care and right. have continuity is it's amazing. Right. And we should say that we get our care at Stanford. So we have to thank Dr. Day. We have to thank Dr. Um, Caroline Tessie Rocha, um, Carolina Watson, Jess, Jessica, who's not here, but is the best. Mm -hmm. Who else? Yeah. Many, many other yeah. people we're not mentioning. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for yeah. putting this together um, in the middle of a pandemic because it's been so great just to connect with the community. And um, I'm sure we'll have more that we want <laughs> later on. But right now we're in a great place and we're just super yeah. happy that we get the care that we do. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. It's It's been our honor and privilege to, to hear your perspectives today. Um, and I uh, hope we can, you guys, it sounds like maybe you three of you, your families can keep this dialogue going for a long time, uh, learning from each other. Uh, Carly, any last comments? We had a we bunch of, yeah, I mean, there's still a bunch of questions that we didn't get to answer today. So, I um, don't know if we have the ability to go back and answer these Sundays to our panelists and maybe get some answers. If we have that ability, we will do that and post them to the Whova site. Yeah, I think we'll have that ability. And I think we'll also be able to put up the videos of the different sessions so that people can check back uh, to get answers to the questions as well as uh, to kind of uh, participate or, or relive some of the sessions that they weren't able to be part of. So I think that brings our, our course to a, a conclusion. I think it's, it's hard to leave. So, you know, it's, uh, we really all benefited from this, uh, but the time has come. I think it, this is where, you know, Zoom is a little, is a little tough because there's such a, an absolute end to this thing. Uh, as opposed to kind of meandering around and lingering in the hallway and having us fade out. So uh, I'm afraid that we've come to that place and we'll kind of leave things on for those who want to stay around, but uh, there's nothing else here. So it really is kind of empty. <laughs> so thanks so much to everybody for participating. It really was a great effort. And uh, please give us your feedback about what worked and what else we can do. Uh, to keep this all moving forward. So thank you all a, a lot. A special thanks to our patients uh, for really spending uh, your Saturday with us. We really appreciate it. So thank you. you clap there. Yes, a little clap. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>